praise the Lord. There is no other name like Jesus. No. There's no salvation in any other name than Jesus. Amen. And uh, we best not forget that. There's no salvation in ourselves. There's no salvation of the church can't save you. Religion can't save you. The Baptist can't save you. A Bible can't save you if you don't read it. Only Jesus Christ can save your soul. Right. I hope you know that only Jesus died on the cross so that you could go free. Right. And yeah. I hope that you're all saved today. I can't assume one way or the other. Only you know. Only God knows. Mm -hmm. I hope that you make it personal today. I hope that you don't leave with any kind of doubt for your everlasting soul. Because whether you like it or not, we leave this world. We're going somewhere. Yeah. And it'll either be heaven or hell by the word of God and by his truth. Now I ask if you would open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm thankful for each and every one of you that are here today visiting. Members coming back, regulars coming back, whatever you want to say. Everybody's here for a purpose today. I hope you believe that. Whether you think so or not, there's a purpose in everything that's done. And uh, there's a purpose of how everything is set up. And God has a way of setting everything up for perfection. When we listen to the Lord, we're in His will. There's blessing in listening to the Lord, believe it or not. Uh, the Bible's not full of anecdotes and suggestions and fun little stories that you just tell the kids when they're in Sunday school. Uh, Jonah and the whale is just as relevant to uh, the oldest person walking the earth to the youngest person walking the earth. Daniel and the lion's den is just as relevant to the oldest person on the earth to the youngest person on the earth. Everything in this Bible is for everybody. And I hope you know that today. And when we do things by God's design, we do see the blessings of God. We see His favor on things. It doesn't mean that everything always goes without these little bumps and bruises. Don't misunderstand. This world is a sin-cursed world. It's a fallen world. But nevertheless, God still gives us instruction where if we want the blessings, we want to get through the hard times as well as the good, we look at what He says on things. And today, the title of the message is called Being Circumspect in Relationships. Being Circumspect in relationships, all right? I want to start off with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into the message today. A lot to do today. So let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you certainly for your Son, Jesus Christ. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I just I pray, Lord, that you empty me of myself. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Just let me be a mouthpiece for you, Lord. Let there be no flesh showing up here in your sacred desk. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you... Help us be focused on your word today, Lord. Again, keep the distractions out. The devil doesn't like what we're doing here today. And that's kind of the point. I just pray, Lord, that we'd be honest before you today, Lord, that we may walk out better than we did when we came in. No matter where we're at in life, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's take a look at Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15. The Bible says... See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Well, we'll stop for a second there. You know, circumspectly is not something that, it's not a word that you hear a lot. A lot of people don't use it. Uh, so because of that, I reach for my trusty dictionary. They still exist. And what I tend to do when I'm reading the Bible or really looking into anything, if there's a word I'm not sure of, I want to go make sure of it. So I grab the dictionary, I take a look, and this is what the dictionary pretty much said. There's several definitions. They're all pretty much the same. But to be circumspect means to be wary and unwilling to take risk. And it's basically living in wisdom, if you will. Uh, I'm not a big risk taker. I'm, uh, I'm very conservative in a lot of things. I'm not a speed guy. Uh, you know, if you catch me going five over the speed limit, that's as rebellious as it really gets for me. Some of you, you like your you know, race cars and different things like that. More power to you. I think that's great. Uh, roller coaster's not my thing. You know, race cars not really my thing. I do like go-karts, believe it or not. Uh, and I do like to bump when you're told not to bump. I, I have a competitive edge. You know, you just, you got to do it under the tunnel where the, the workers don't see, of course. But when, it's, when the Bible's talking about walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, if you're all going to be honest with yourself, regardless of what kind of relationship, whether you even do or not with the Lord at this point, in this moment, nobody ever wants to be known as a fool. I, I think that's pretty fair to, to say. Nobody wants to be looked at as foolish or, you know, so, a goof or something like that. You want to be looked at as someone who has some wisdom, someone who has some ability to make decisions, especially in hard situations. Well, the main focus on the message today is on relationships and, and studying about it. And given we're celebrating the Wilbers and their 65th wedding anniversary today, um, really, you, you could just have them come up here if they would have been willing. And I don't think they would have. They just picked their brain. I, I mean, me and Nikki are going on. We'll be married six years in May. 
And praise God. I mean, what a wonderful thing. I wouldn't trade my wife and my kids for anything. God bless me with my family. And I hope if, if we physically live that long, the Lord tarries on this earth, I hope we can one day say 65 years and counting. What a wonderful blessing. It's not really something you see a lot of, to be honest with you. And I think that there's such a wealth of wisdom there. You don't just stay together being fools. You stay together being wise and walking circumspectly. So what we're going to look at here is, number one, where's our relationship with the Lord? Okay? And we're going to see how actually earthly marriage ties in with heavenly marriage. It's all intertwined. Everything's a picture ultimately pointing to God and his love. All right, so let's look a little further. In verse 16, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, if you're going to have a good relationship with the Lord, and we're going to start with that, all right, before we go into, you know, spousal relationship, uh, if you're going to have a good relationship with the Lord, it's probably a good idea to listen to what he says. Would you agree, yes or yes? Hey, we made it easy for you, right? It's a, there's only one right answer there, of course. And would we all agree that the days we're living in are pretty evil nowadays? Yeah, of course. Of course it is. And when it says in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil, the days are also short. We're, we don't know how much time we have on this earth. I hope that anybody who in here is married gets to see 65. I hope everybody in here gets to live past 100. I really do. I, 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 hope, I hope I do. You know, I certainly, whatever it is. But uh, the truth of the matter is we don't know when our last day is going to be. We just don't. So we need to make the most of every day that we have. Now, the world has a message like that, too. But theirs is about getting health and, and prosperity and living, you know, eat and drink and, and you know, be merry for tomorrow we die. It's kind of their, their uh, mindset on things. And what a shallow mindset, because your life is just much more than, you know, whatever you can gain in this world. There'll always be a richer guy. There'll always be somebody, you know, at one point being a millionaire was a big deal. But then, you know what, people became billionaires. And then at another point, I'm pretty sure there's some trillionaires on this earth. And I, if there's a, I don't know what's after a quadrillionaire. I don't know. There's got to be something for four. But there'll always be a richer guy. There'll always be someone with a little bit bigger of a house. There'll always be someone with a little bit sportier of a car. Someone with a little bit nicer duds. Whatever it may be. Someone with a nicer hunting rifle. Someone with a nicer, you know, ATV. Whatever it may be. Nicer golf, golf clubs. Whatever you're into. But... We don't know when, you know, what's it all for? Now, there's nothing wrong with having those things. If you're able to, there's nothing wrong as long as your priorities are right. Please don't misunderstand. But knowing that your days are short and the days are evil, the Bible says for us to redeem the time or buy back the time. And it's so important that you don't waste the time that you were given because you don't know how much time you do have. Now, how does this relate with a relationship with the Lord? Well, God is the one that's allowing you to suck air this second. And every breath you've ever breathed, I, I, it's an example I use a lot because it's so true. Because none of it, you can't see oxygen. You're just going to assume that when you try and inhale, all, air is going to go in your body. It's going to give you the things you need. You're going to stay alive. And we take it for granted. Every one of you, how many breaths do you think you've taken just since sitting in the pew today? You, who knows? You just know that when you inhale, you're going to get some oxygen and stay alive. But one day, you'll breathe your last breath. Okay, and we need to be understanding that while we're here on this earth, we need to be living for the Lord. There's enough people in this world that are, have no problem living for themselves. You know why a lot of marriages don't last? Because people are too busy worrying about and living for themselves. They don't care about who they're hurting. They don't care about uh, the wake of destruction that they may leave in their path. All they care about is me, myself, and I. And it hurts people in their individual lives. It hurts people in a marriage life. It'll certainly hurt you in your spiritual life. When all you care about is you, You've missed the point of living. You've missed the point. Uh, as Brother Carl said in his, uh, in his song, I think actually before he sang the song, you know, we're created for him. He didn't create us to you know, make this all a fun world and everything. And just, hey, man, go have a blast and then you'll come up to heaven and just be a good person. The world will tell you that. Well, how do you know if you're good enough or not? Really, how would you ever know if you've achieved enough goodness? There are so many people that say, well, we'll let the Lord sort it out at the end. Yeah, at the end where there's nothing you can do if you haven't done enough. Is your eternity really worth Putting it on the chance? That's not working circumspectly. That's living in risk. No relationship is worth taking risks for. Think about the person that you love the most in this world. Would you be willing to risk their relationship for something that might be great for a moment? I hope not. Otherwise, you need to work on your heart. That's not right. That's not right. And especially when we're talking about our, our relationship with the Lord. Look at verse 17. It says, Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You should be seeking for what God's will is for your life, not just what you want to do. 
You know, every one of us at some point had parents or somebody tell us, listen, I'm just doing it because I know what's best for you. And as a kid, probably you're thinking, like, you don't know what's best for me. This is the fun thing. This is what I want to do now. But parents have been around the block. I'm finding it out now. I've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old now. And uh, I find that, yes, I, I know what's best for them. It's not best for them to have sugar after a certain time. It's actually better for us that they don't have sugar after a certain time. We tell them it's for them. Oh, Dad, can I have a bite of that vanilla ice cream? It's too spicy, buddy. You don't want to have that. It's not for you. It's, it, trust me, we know what's best for you. But do you believe that God knows what's best for you? Amen. Don't you want to be in his will? Amen. Because what's the opposite of being out of God? It, it's out of God's will. The opposite of being in God's will is being out of it. You, nobody wants to be out of God's will. Nobody in their right mind would want that. So you want a close relationship with him. It says in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the same, or I'm sorry, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves uh, one to another in the fear of God. Let me tell you something. You know, a lot of people, especially you know, in relationships, you know, if you've ever got a love note in your life. Someone's ever written you a little secret love note, whether it was in school or whatever. Maybe it's a card on your birthday, whatever it may be. And, and I know and there's a good set of guys in here and probably say, ah, oh, I don't really. Man, I don't know about you. I do like to see those love notes. Yeah. It's nice to see on paper how someone feels because you can tell them all the day long. And it's 100% true. But reading it, someone taking the time and writing a nice thought down about you or something is very special. Well, God gave us a love letter. It's called his Bible. He gave us the ultimate form of love, and that's sending his son to die on the cross for us. What a wonderful thing. And when, uh, you know, when I think about it, I like going through memories. I'm someone who I can't get off memory lane sometimes. I take a turn on that street, and I stay on it for a long time. I'm looking at photographs. I'm thinking about the memories that go along with it, cards, different notes, and things like that. Because it's good to be reminded how much you're loved. Everybody wants to be loved. Okay? But we also need to think about how much... The Lord loves us and how much we need to love the Lord. See, when you look at a verse like uh, verse 19, what it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, praising and serving him. Hey, I love you, Lord. I'm not going to just tell everybody about how I love you. I'm going to show you that I love you. I can tell everybody, oh, I love my wife and stuff, but if I never tell her, it's not, who cares? She needs to be the one that knows that I love her. I can impress anybody out here and try and trick you and think, oh, we got the best marriage. But if we don't, and if I never say anything to her about that, it's all shallow. And what do I care what everybody else thinks on the overall except for what my wife thinks? I want her to know that I love her and I would jump in front of a train for her. And I would. What would you do for the Lord? The one who gave you everything. In your relationship with God, what are you willing to give him? Can you give him a Sunday morning? Can you give them a Thursday night? Can you give them a, you know, a 10 to 15 minute devotional in, your, in the Bible every day? Can you pray to him? Can you just give thanks? Because that's the next verse. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives you everything. Yeah. said before, we're spoiled children. We really are. God just, he takes care of us and then some. He gives us so much. So you know what? I can certainly speak to myself some psalms and hymns and be reminded of how good God is. Because if you're not taking the time to remember how good God is, you're not thinking about Him. Does the world not give us enough distraction from God? Things that aren't of God? There's plenty of things out there. There's plenty of stress out there. You all know what I'm talking about. There's just so much, and they're not necessarily wrong inherently. But when other things usurp the time that you spend in your relationship with the Lord, there's a problem there. If you're married and there's things that step into your time that you should be spending with your spouse, there's a problem there. You know, when, when golf or bowling league becomes more of an important thing than spending that time with your wife, there's a problem. When going, uh, you know, going out and ladies, you know, because I'm not one, I don't know what all you like to do. I don't want to be stereotypical. I guess shop. People say shopping, different things like that. If you don't like it, whatever it is, it's hard for me to relate. I don't know. But whatever you like to do, nothing wrong with it inherently. But if you're doing more of that than spending time with your spouse, that's wrong. If you're doing more things to serve the world and serve yourself and things and you're not serving the Lord, it's wrong. You'll tell yourself it's not. You'll say, well, I got a hard life and all this stuff. And you might. I'm sure a lot of you do. But it doesn't give you an excuse not to be good to the Lord. Right. He's been good to you. Yeah. When you didn't believe, when you do believe, and you backslidden, whatever it may be, He's always been good. Amen. 
We need to be good to him. We need to sing to him. We need to give him all the glory, honor, and praise. It's a chest-thumping society. Being a big sports guy, you always see these guys when someone hits a big game-winning shot, and they're out there thumping their chest. Oh, look at the shot that I just made. But the more impressive teammate to me is the one that says, man, I wouldn't have got that shot if my team hadn't played good defense, got that steal, got me the ball, and I hit the shot. They're, I'm building my own brand. Your brand is the name across the front. Is in my opinion. That's not popular today. They probably ban you from sports if you said something like that. But it's about the team that you play for. What team do you play for? What you know, what's your family name? Do you play for your family or do you play for you? Is it about the name on the back of your so-called jersey or is it about the one on the front? Are you about serving the Lord and God's team or are you about serving yourself? Are you about building your own life, your own empire, so to speak? That's not a good relationship. None of you would like it if your spouse or anybody that you love very much treated you maybe the way that you treated them. Think about that for a second. Relationships are a mirror. You want your spouse, you know, whoever it is in your life that you love, you want them to treat you a certain way. But are you willing to treat your spouse or your whoever that same special way? Oh, we all like to get all the good stuff, but we don't always like to put the stuff back in. We want all the blessings of God. But when something goes wrong, well, God, why would you do this to me? Well, you know what? Are you serving him? Or is he nothing more than a spare tire in your trunk? Well, I'll just bring you out when I need you. That's not a good relationship. You don't get to 65 years of earthly marriage doing that. You don't get to a good relationship with the Lord doing that. Now, he still loves you. He's willing for you to come back any time. God doesn't leave, understand. He doesn't move on. He's not the one that's doing the cheating. It's usually the person that's out doing the cheating and cheating on God. That's what it is. And he's a jealous God. Any one of us who find out about it, you're a jealous person. Let's be honest. You find out that your significant other is talking to someone else, that, there's, a, there's alarms going off there, right? That's not right. I'd be jealous. I certainly would be. So let's look at what the Bible says about cultivating that relationship with husband and wife. Okay? And then we'll tie it up here at the end. In verse 22... Don't throw anything at me. This is what the Bible says. We're gonna, hey, it's the truth. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, let's just hit the brakes here for a second. <laughs> the world has ruined the basis of this. I am all for women's rights. But as far as what the feminist movement is out there, it, it, a lot of it, and not all, I'm not gonna, I don't make blanket statements, but a lot of it is to degrade a man, make you make ladies think you don't need a man. And it's all about the whole message is about being a strong, independent female. That's all you hear, and it's the biggest thing. Listen, ladies, it's not wrong to be strong. It's not wrong to have, be independent. I mean, there's time in there, there's going to be a time in your life where you may not be married. Some ladies live in singleness their whole life, as do some men. There's nothing wrong with strong, independent, but God's design, if he has put you in an opportunity to be in a relationship, he's blessed you in that way. There's a role that that husband does play for you. And husbands, there's a role that that wife does play too. You see, two become one flesh. Yeah. It's, come, it's that team thing again. It's two becoming one. Now, when the Bible says submit, uh, it says uh, in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. The world heard that today. If, if, we had, if this was on the news or something like that, they'd, it'd be pitchforks, it'd be fire and stuff like that. And it, but it's God's plan. And people say, well, of course you can stand up there and say that you're a man. Hold on just a second, ladies, because men, it's your turn now. And we'll get back to this in a second. Verse 25 says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Guys, there's a big, big, big load of responsibility on our shoulders for our darling wives. There is. Any man that sits there and acts like a tyrant in front of their wife isn't a man. Now, let me say that again. Any so-called man that would stand up there and be a tyrant and try and be a boss and a king over their wife is not a real man. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, Jesus is our king, and we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Well, how did Christ love the church? Well, for one, he gave his life for it. He got beat for it. He got mocked and ridiculed for it. Anytime you're going to do things God's way, the world isn't going to like it. You're going to be looked at as backwards. You're going to be looked at as archaic, old-fashioned. 
I hate when people use the year as an excuse for living however they want. Oh, it's 2021. Yeah, I can read a calendar. I understand that, but God tells me that he is consistent. He tells me he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change with the times. His word is absolute. It's forever settled in heaven. He's not up there making edits. Oh, man, I forgot it's 2021. You know what? Actually, it's equal. Matter of fact, man, you should be submitting to your wife. It doesn't say that. It says, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. He loved us so much again that he died for us. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. He was long-suffering, and he is long-suffering. You know what that means? He's patient. He doesn't just fly off the handle and everything isn't an inconvenience and stuff. You think about the things that we take to the Lord on a daily basis and he doesn't kill us. That's some supreme patience by the Lord. So many Christian relationships do end in divorce. Some of them here today are in it, going through it and different things like that. I have good news though. You know God don't throw anybody in the trash. You know what? We're in a sin-cursed world and things don't always go according to plan, do they? You'd mean for him to, you absolutely like to, but some things, things just happen. God still loves you. Yeah. And folks, he loves the one that got hurt as much as he does he loves the person who did the hurting. Now that's something that's a little bit harder to swallow, but it's true. God's willing that none should perish and that all should come to repentance. That's how much God loves us. We like to think God loves our little bubble right here, like Lighthouse Baptist Church of Rome. Isn't that warm and fuzzy? He loves all of us, and he does. But he loves the atheists out there cursing God every chance he gets and things like that. Out there, you know, living a, a terrible, you know, sinful life. He loves them just as much as he loves you. Doesn't that blow your mind? Doesn't that blow your mind? You know, what's interesting about uh, marriage, you know, we talk about wives submitting to your husbands. Husbands love your wives. You know, you kind of almost can't have one without the other. You really can. I feel that a good Christian wife, it's so much easier to submit to a husband who's loving them as Christ loves the church. That's how it fits. That's how it fits. It's not a bad thing. But there's so much poison. Being, men, it, it, they, they talk about toxic max, masculinity. You may have heard that term. I'd like to know what that is. Uh, I might have it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you something. As a man, I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like sports. There are some things I like to dabble in the arts. Uh, <laughs> Not personally, but I do enjoy I like watching a play and, and going to concerts and things like that. And orchestras, I like that stuff. Uh, I like having a beard. Today it's particularly useful. It's cold outside. Uh, I'm raising my sons to grow up and be men. They don't get a choice of what they're going to be. God already decided it for them. People can ultimately do with their free will what they're going to do, but you can't change what God has already settled. Amen. You can't. And I'm sorry for the people who have issues with that. Folks, the devil's taking a field day with that. I don't, I don't look at these people like, oh, what a bunch of freaks or something like that. Here's some people that the devil's got in and completely warped their life. They need prayer. They need love. They need the gospel. Amen. They need to be told the truth. talk about letting our light shine. All right, lighthouse. By the way, if you all didn't get a chance to see that lighthouse, now it's all painted up, and I thank Alicia and Griff for painting that and taking care of it. It looks gorgeous down there. Of course, uh, Miss Lori's uh, uh, son, Johnny, he made that, and uh, there's little LED lights. I think my wife figured out how to get them to rotate or whatever. It's beautiful. Well, you think about a lighthouse. You know, if you were to talk to someone who made their living on the sea or on a lake or something like that, how important a lighthouse is to them. That lets you know where safety is at. Let you know you're almost home. There's something about a lighthouse. God's our lighthouse, is he not? He, is. He's, he lets us know where that safety is. He lets us know where the safe harbor is. He takes care of us and he protects us. That's what he does for his church. Husbands, you need to be a lighthouse in your house, if that makes any sense. You need to be a beacon to let people hey, there's safety here. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to love you. I, and, and I don't care if it means i got to miss this or miss that or this, that, and the other thing. Man, you've got to be sacrificial. You gotta be. Not to the point where you're a doormat. Not to the point where you've absolutely been, you know, uh, as they say, maybe you get your man card taken away. You're still a man and things like that. You understand. But you do need to submit to your, or I'm sorry, you do need to love and honor and give sacrifice. As Jesus gave sacrifice for his church. Don't forget, he prayed before he was taken under arrest. And if this cup would pass from me, that gets to me. 
He prayed and sweated so much that the sweat drops were like blood drops. That means a lot bigger than a sweat drop. That tells me Jesus was going through something right there. Yeah. Right? And I want to tell you something. Because, I'll be honest, as a preacher, it is hard to say, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Even though it's truth, it's sitting right here. I can't argue that. It doesn't matter if I like what's in this Bible. Right. I was never called to like it. I'm called to believe it. Yeah. Not as a brainwash, not as a drone, but you know what? The Lord has done enough in my life to prove to me he's real. Yes. He shows me every day. He's done miracle after miracle after miracle. He'll continue to do it. He's faithful. But when you consider this, and doing things God's way, and you see the blessing of it, folks, let me tell you something. As the church, we are the bride of Christ. That's important. Now, we're going to rein this back into a little bit of your own individual selves for a second. And men, sometimes it can be hard to wrap your mind around this, but we are part of the bride of Christ. It's a little bit hard to get your mind into that, and it is for me at times, too. But I want you to consider something. Would you marry you how you're living right now? Ladies, would you marry you how you're living right now? By God's standard. Because we're his wife. His bride. You don't think he's, he's excited, folks. He can't wait for his marriage day. The marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be fantastic. You want to talk about a banquet? Yeah. A heavenly banquet with Jesus, our bridegroom. He's waiting for the Father to give him the go-ahead. I, 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 you know, I don't want to make, it's not a joke or anything like that, but i got to believe he's anxious to get down and get a hold of his bride. When, I, you know, when uh, Nikki and I were engaged, you know, especially as the, the date was approaching. See, now at that point, it wasn't, we did know the day or the hour we were getting married. Otherwise, it would have been a strange wedding. We knew. We had it settled. But as that time was getting close, you know, the excitement, the nerves, the anxiety, the, oh, man, we're almost there. A lot of different feelings. But I couldn't wait to get married. I think Jesus is, he's He's ready. And he loves us. But you know, some marriages don't work out because it, they don't want to see it as a team. Yes, we may take the wife to submit. Again, it also takes the husband to love. It's not just one, you do all this and I'll just do whatever I like. That's trash. That's not of God. That's sinful. Folks, there's been preachers that don't know how to treat a wife. Believe it. Act like you need to bow down as if they were God themselves. Baloney. Men, you know what? As husbands, we're, we're sinners saved by grace if we're saved today. That, that's about as much as we mount up to. That's just the truth. Yeah. And let's not go getting puffed up here. A wedding day is coming. And we do need to consider it. Would you marry you right now? Are you pure? Are you clean? Are you saved? Are you even going to be part? Are you even going to be a part of the bride? That's the important thing. I hope the Lord goes up and down every single row. It just speaks to your heart personally. You know, a lot of the you know a lot of things in the world is oh, don't judge me, don't judge me. Well, I tell you what, I'm not here to judge anybody. If I'm going to judge you, you judge me by the same judgment I put upon you anyway. So I don't want to judge anybody. I, I want you to have your spiritual needs met today. Amen. I don't care if you've been saved for a hundred years. We're somewhere with our walk with the Lord. You know, in marriage, you go on six years, and I, my poor wife, she probably was like, I didn't know this is going to get brought up this much today. <laughs> Surprise, but <laughs> happy Valentine's Day. No, that, uh, there's something better than that, I promise. But it's going to be much better than I thought now, too, I'm sure. But <laughs> believe it or not, as much as I love my wife, guess what? We've had some days that weren't the best days. We've had some days we were walking on cloud nine. And there's been a lot of days in the in-between. You know, as much as we want to be super Christians, right? We want to be as close to the Lord as we possibly can. And that should be our driving. You know what? There are days where we just don't 
We just don't add up, do we? Right. There's some honest people in here today. All right, amen. <laughs> you want to, but you fall short. Aren't you glad the Lord doesn't throw you in the trash? Yes. You, can, you know, listen. Today could be a day that you'll never forget. You get right. You get saved. It could be anything. You could get an answer for a question that you may have been wondering about the Lord for so long. And I'll ask you this. Saved, not sure, married, single, wherever you're at in life. How much does the Lord mean to you? How much does he mean to you? What are you willing to do for him? How are you willing to live for him? Again, a lot of people, they don't have a bit of trouble taking the benefits from a loving God. But when it, when the rubber hits the road, and the Lord said, yeah, but I expect you to live this way. And by the way, if you live this way, there's blessings attached to the way that you live. Probably not the easy way. Matter of fact, a lot of times it's not. You know, one thing that always gets me is people who want to refer to God as the man upstairs. Uh, you mean the God who spoke existence by his very mouth? Right. You mean the one who lets you live every day you've ever lived? You're going to call him the man upstairs? People call their dad my old man? That was the dad that probably busted your hind end a few times. You want to call him your old man? I wouldn't. That's risky. <laughs> and that's not worth walking circumspectly if we're walking risky. Your relationship with the Lord is not something to risk. Think, well, I think I'm saved. Not worth the risk. Nope. I think I'm living pretty right with the Lord. Not worth the risk. Nope. You see, because if you're going to live outside of the Lord's will, there's going to be punishment. If you're God's child, you will be chastised. You know what that means? You're going to be punished. Because He loves you. And because He wants to straighten you out. Because He's constantly doing a good work in you. Whether you want Him to or not, He's still God. Would you redeem the time today? Would you redeem the time? The truth of the matter is, not, we, uh, I'll probably say this every, every message because it couldn't be more true. You may never sit in this pew again. Right. Member or visitor or whatever. You may never sit. I may never stand behind this pulpit again. I have no guarantee any more than any of you do. Is it worth taking the risk? If you're in a relationship today, if you're married today, is it worth taking a risk? Is it worth being unfaithful? Is it worth being selfish? Is it worth being hateful and mean? Is it worth being self-serving? Or is it worth being sacrificial? Is it worth being loving and strong? Is it worth being true? You have to make that decision. God gives us free will, doesn't he? Yeah. You know, he lets you make your choices, good or bad. A lot of people want to blame God when things go wrong, but if they really want to be honest and look back and reflect on their life, and they're going to be honest with themselves, like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I should have been better at that. I should have, you know, check, 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 all these different things. And we know that. And it's all of us, folks. It's me, just the same as you. Society will tell you it's always somebody else's fault. The Bible's here to tell you it's you. <laughs> it's, it's you. At least it's a level playing field. You can, you can work on yourself or you can't work on other people. That's a good thing. Because I'm a husband, a husband, I'll give you a little bit more and we'll be done. We talked about, you know, not calling God the man upstairs. Not calling your dad the old man. I hope you don't have some little dumb name to call your wife either. Ball and chain, really? <laughs> Hey, no ball and chain. Help me. Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. I'll read that to you. If you want to join me there, you can. This is the first marriage, Adam and Eve. Genesis 2, 22. It says, In the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man 
leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. It was the ultimate team. God created a help meet for Adam. Adam didn't, he didn't uh, take a, you know, a liking to the animals that were there or anything like that. God made someone in, uh, in his image. From the rib of a man, he made woman. That's how he was created. Men, it's not good for any of us to be alone, is it? It's not for me. I don't like being alone. That help meet's important. One of the biggest uh, praises, if you will, that I give from my wife is, you know, it's uncanny. And only God could do it with the areas of life where I'm not very strong. She excels at it. And I would like to think God, the same is on the reverse. Maybe on things where she would say, I'm not as strong as that, but he sure is. Because you know what's cool about it? One. Two becomes one. We're together. If you're married today, you're together. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. The Lord gives us everything we could ever really want or need. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the Wilbers today. Uh, I'm like 99% sure this is the first 65th anniversary anything I've ever heard of, seen, been a part of. That's amazing. And I hope you come and get to know them, love on them here in just a minute when we go downstairs. I want that. I'm not just saying that. I mean, I don't, I don't ever want to leave my wife's side. I, I, want her to, I want them to be together for good. Well, I think if we follow the Bible, I'm pretty confident we're going to get there if the Lord tarries. If he doesn't take one of us home beforehand. And same with you. You may just begin to start it. No matter where you're at in your age, it doesn't matter. It's not about, like, well, i gotta got to hit that 65 milestone. But it's about the longevity of being true to somebody. The world's mentality is, well, I'll use you until I'm bored with you, then you hit the road. Oh, well, there's some hard times, so you know what? I don't want to I don't want have to work through anything, so why don't you leave? I don't want any commitment in my life. Come on, guys. How would you feel if the Lord treated you like that? I don't want any commitment with you. You're not going to be that faithful to me and stuff like you're out. But he doesn't do that. Take advantage of the grace that he gives you and live for him. Take advantage of the love that you get from your spouse and grow with that. It's a marriage is a great gift. Marriage is a great gift. And one day, single or married, wherever you're at in your life, divorce, whatever it may be, maybe you never get married, whatever it is. If you're saved, you will get married to the best husband there ever could be. The one who gave his life for all the world, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's completely worth it. And I hope you're there today. Let's stand on our feet and bow our heads in a word of prayer.